Thank you very much for coming. Some of you are sort of forced to come for bad news now. Uh, so uh, I'm very glad and honored to have uh, Dr. Kieran Grewal uh, to uh, deliver a lecture on her studies. Uh, this seminar uh, is co-organized, proposed by the ITM, the uh, International Research Group on uh, Migrations uh, based at SESH, by the, the other important three years of uh, FCD funded uh, project, and co-organized by these two groups and the PhD programs in Family Studies and International Conflicts of and uh, Conflicts of Resolutions. Um, so, uh, Kieran is going to uh, talk about the everyday life of human rights law. And uh, mm, she's a leader in sociology at Goldsmith College, University of London, has worked uh, as a scholar, a practitioner, and activist in the field of human rights for the last 15 years. Her area, areas of specialization are women's rights, torture, and post conflict justice processes. Most recently, she has been working with different groups in the north and east of Sri Lanka, struggling for social justice. She is the author of two books, The Social Political, pra Political Practice of Human Rights, which you can find in our library, uh, SESH, and The Rationalized Gay Rape and the Reinforcement of Dominant Order, Discourses of Gender, Race, and Nation, uh, published in uh, 2017. So I'll, uh, I'll give her the word and um, uh, the seminar, um, and their speech is going to uh, uh, last more or less one hour, and then we're going to have another hour for debate. Uh, um, um, okay. so, thank you. Great, thank you very much. So, uh, thank you, Gaia. Um, Gaia has been a long time uh, friend and uh, internet intellectual conversation partner, so it's really wonderful. Thank you for bringing me here and thank you for the PhD programs that have funded me coming um, and thank you for taking the time to come and listen to me. Um, so just to start off with, obviously English is my native language and when I get excited, as I often do when I'm speaking in public places, I can talk a little bit fast. So please, if I'm going too fast or I'm not clear, just do this and I will try and slow down. And if people have kind of questions or points of clarification as I'm speaking, feel free to interrupt me. I can always start talking again. Um, so, uh, yeah, so that's by way of introduction. So I wanted to start um, with four little stories. Um, the first is about a sex worker in the eastern town of, uh, sorry, the southern east, southeastern town of Ratnapura in Sri Lanka. Um, she uh, was beaten by a police officer in public, uh, whipped with an electric cable. Um, some people at a bus stand um, caught this on their phone and the video went viral in Sri Lanka. Um, some human rights activists from Colombo, the capital, uh, went to find her and um, brought her to Colombo to support her starting a fundamental rights case. Uh, in the Sri Lankan courts. Um, she became known as Rata Purabhati. Um, very little was known about her. Um, she was a sex worker, a drug user. Um, she had no national identity card for Sri Lanka. She didn't even know her ethnic background, which if any of you, you know anything about Sri Lanka and the ethnic conflict, that's quite significant. Um, she rebelled against the human rights lawyers um, and while the case continued through the courts, she ran away because they were trying to force her into a respectable life she didn't want. Um, and she disappeared somewhere in the east of Sri Lanka. Um, but uh, two months ago, the court issued her compensation, um, so she finally won her case. Um, in the meantime, it started a bit of a discussion in Sri Lanka because she was a sex worker and a drug user. Um, about whether or who this woman was and why it was that the police officer should be punished. There were actually protests in Ratnapura where respectable society led by Buddhist monks protested in favour of the police officer. So it started an interesting conversation about the dignity that is supposed to be protected in human rights. So that's the first story. The second story is the story of Amelie. Amelie um, was a housewife, um, lived in a small village in Batiklo district uh, in the east of Sri Lanka. 
Her husband was a farmer. In 2009, he went out to his field um, and didn't come back. He was picked up, witnesses say, by police. Police say they didn't pick him up. Uh, so he has been disappeared since 2009. Amelie went from being a housewife to doing the rounds of all of the government offices, police headquarters, army barracks, looking for her husband, and has now become a little bit of a figure in the district. Many other families of the disappeared come to seek advice from her. She's now connected with other families of the disappeared around Sri Lanka. She's met the president. She has protested in the streets and most recently went to Geneva. Um, I asked her what that trip was like and she said, so beautiful and so much nice chocolate, but I was so busy at the UN, I didn't have time to do anything. So that's Amelie. The third story, I don't have a name for this woman. Uh, she's a woman who I met at a gathering um, of the Women's Coalition in Eastern Sri Lanka, which is a mixture of women from all different backgrounds, through from women in fishing communities, through to professors, lawyers, um, activists. Uh, this was a Muslim woman who was talking, we, we were having a discussion about what human rights law meant for these women. And this Muslim woman comes from a small village, um, a small town south of Batiklo, which is a, a stronghold of the Muslim fundamentalist community. Um, so very, very orthodox. Um, her husband was working in the Middle East, as many Sri Lankans um, are, and she wanted to ride a motorcycle. The local mosque community banned her from riding a motorcycle. She decided she would do it anyway, and she went to the Human Rights Commission, and she got herself a motorcycle. The mosque community issued threats, and she went to the police. The police intervened and told them that they would prosecute people if they did anything to her and she has now been riding her motorcycle for a year and a half and tells me that there are now eight other women in Kathankuri who are also riding motorcycles. The final story that I'll tell you is of a woman called Vetri Telvi. Uh, Vetri Telvi was from the west, northwest of Sri Lanka joined the Tamil Tiger movement, the LTTE, when she was young. Um, became quite a senior woman in the LTTE. Um, a, a, was a women's officer. Uh, lost one of her arms and one of her eyes in the war. Was involved in the final surrender. And has now set up a, dis a movement for women with disabilities across the North <coughs> Sri Lanka. And I met her for the first time because she was launching um, a new office in a town that I spent quite a lot of time in the northeast, and asked me to come to the launch. And at the launch, she waved the copy of the um, Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights report on Sri Lanka, a tomb this, this thick, and waved it at the other women and said, we are in here, we need to use this, we need to lobby the government to provide us women with disability with services. So these four stories are just a little taste of the stories that, as I can move through various places, but most recently in Sri Lanka, the stories of people who are invoking the language of human rights in some way. So the starting point really for me with the current project that I'm working on that comes out of my book on human rights was how it was that I, um, having worked in the field of human rights for quite a few years and being very critical of the Human Rights Project and coming from a kind of critical legal studies background had spent a lot of time and many of people who I respect a lot, many friends, have done a lot of critical work on the elitist, um, the elitism of human rights, the exclusionary operation of human rights, the neo-colonial implications of human rights, the way in which human rights accompanies neoliberal economic policies. So how to make sense of those critiques, which I think are valid, alongside the fact that people in different parts of the world, in different positions, are invoking this language. So what do we make of this? Is this simply a sign of their desperation? Is it a misguided belief that human rights will give them something that we know, we, the critical scholars, know it won't? Is it a failure of the more radical projects of revolution 
as Samuel Moy has argued, the last utopia that we hold on to now that we have given up on all of these other more emancipatory projects. Ultimately, I've decided that while there may be elements of truth in all of those things, that they are ultimately inadequate. One, even if there is an element of desperation, even if it is that people are going to human rights, going to speak to the High Commissioner for Human Rights or the Human Rights Commission or the various commissions for disappearance, for transitional justice, it doesn't negate the fact that there is still productive potential in that space. Furthermore, to assume that these people who, like Amelie or Bati or Vetra Chelby, are misguided and naive that they think the system will give them something, I think is incredibly patronizing, um, especially because many of the people that I'm thinking of are actually already amongst the most marginal and disempowered in the society. So they already know that the system doesn't work for them. It may come as a surprise for those of us with privilege when the system doesn't deliver. But actually, most of the people I'm describing have already many times realized that the dominant institutions don't work for them. So why do they nonetheless go? And it may be that human rights is now the main game in town, that there is lots of money, uh, the human rights organizations that have been set up. But that doesn't mean as far as I'm concerned, that the people who are invoking this language necessarily buy the technocratic governance version of human rights, that maybe we are associating with it. So I'll just give you another little story, and then I'll go back to my earlier ones. So I began thinking about this a lot in 2011. So I had been in 2005 and six. Um, uh, 2006, I was in Sierra Leone uh, working at the Special Court for Sierra Leone. So at that stage, very much part of the international human rights community. And I was really disillusioned by all of the promises of this war crimes tribunal that it was going to deliver justice, particularly for women. This court was heralded as specifically saving the women of Sierra Leone. So seeing that, seeing the promises and then seeing the realities of how women who testified in the court were treated, the absence of most of the women's rights organisations from the court, and the ultimate judgments that were actually incredibly conservative in the ways in which they interpreted gender and crimes of gender. So I was, I'd written critically about these judgments, about how actually the particular prosecution of forced marriage, which was one of the big things that the special court did, how supposedly in the name of women's rights, actually in the judgment ended up reinforcing a very patriarchal, heteronormative version of marriage as something that needed to be protected. And at the same time, kind of gave voice to the most conservative leaders of local communities in the name of respect for cultural difference and how it left all of the more radical feminist uh, activists who wanted to both challenge the cultural norms and to have justice for the women who suffered forced marriage in the war, they were left completely out of that picture. So I was prepared to be completely critical. I went back in 2011 to Sierra Leone to see, okay, what was the legacy of this judgment? What did it produce in terms of women's rights? And I was prepared to find nothing. And many of the human rights groups that I met in Freetown, in the capital, agreed with me. This had been a waste, a waste of money, and at best had done nothing, and at worst had made things worse. But then when I went out into communities, the further away from the capital I got, uh, the more different versions of the story I heard. And so women's groups, uh, the odd female chief of the village would tell me, oh yes, yes, it was good, they prosecuted forced marriage. And with one woman who is actually, she was the head of the, the women's coalition of women's groups in, in uh, Sierra Leone, I said to her, but you've seen the judgment, you've read the judgment, haven't you? It's terrible, <laughs> like the version of marriage that they are reinforcing. And she reached over and sort of patted me on the hand and looked rather pityingly at me and said, 
course I haven't read the judgment, but neither have the men read the judgment. So we go into the village and we say, forced marriage, crime against humanity, international community says, so don't you marry our girls off when they are under age. So that made me think, maybe there is this other thing that is going on with human rights law that actually has nothing to do with reading 600 page judgments and the correct interpretation of the law, but actually a kind of strategic reinterpretation, even misinterpretation of the law, just actually not that much respect for what the law supposedly says, but rather the symbolic power that the law can have as a kind of ally. And to be able to say, yes, the, the special court for Sierra Leone has said this is a crime, that that can be used as a kind of political tool in particular spaces. So that made me start to think, being a kind of legally trained person, that maybe part of the problem for critical scholars of human rights law was that we were giving a bit too much respect to what the law said it was. We were giving priority to the dominant interpretations of law, the correct interpretation, and then the choice is either you accept that dominant interpretation or you reject it. But what if there's something else going on that is neither of those things, that is actually people making use of it in other ways that has nothing to do with that dominant interpretation. So that's I wrote a little bit about this in the, in the Human Rights book, and this is where my new project is taking me. To say, what does it look like to take away some of the power that is given to law, to the dominant interpretations of law, and to interpret the law as it is interpreted by different people in different locations. Now, of course, that doesn't take away the power dimension. I'm not suggesting that the village woman who invokes this is what the law says is standing on equal footing to the international lawyer who will say this is what it means. But that doesn't mean that there's not something productive that might be happening in that interpretation by that particular person in that space. So that was part of the project. So now I want to go back to the stories that I gave you. So now this new book I'm working on, which as I said is called The Everyday Life of Human Rights, Human Rights Law. I'm not sure if I'm gonna stick with so narrow or whether I'm going to make it broader, it's a work in progress. I'm focusing particularly on Sri Lanka and thinking about how do we actually look at what are the different ways in which this body of human rights law is being invoked and interpreted and what are the implications for maybe re-enlivening some kind of radical political project. I am not invested in saving human rights. Maybe, and, and part of what I'm questioning at the moment is maybe actually some of the things that people are describing to me is nothing to do with human rights and maybe I give up on that language altogether. So this is not about a kind of saving the human rights project, but it's asking a question of why have we so easily accepted that there is this thing called human rights law and it is only this dominant hegemonic version of human rights. If I'm just saying, maybe we can turn off the projector, which you don't need it. No, I don't need it. Because it makes noise. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm jumping all over the place, so I wanted to... So, to do this, I've been using quite a lot of Monsier, um, kind of my political theorist of choice at the moment. Um, and I've been thinking about the ways in which Monsier describes the process of la police and la politique, and the relationship between those two. La police, of course, being the, or the, the sensible order that we understand, the institutions of governance that we understand, and la politique being that moment of disruption of that order. The moment that often is fleeting, that can't necessarily be uh, prepared for, and that very quickly is often resubsumed into the sensible order. But what does it mean to pick up on these moments of Ratna Purabhati emerging as someone claiming on human rights, or uh, many of these other women um, who have been associated with families of the disappeared coming forward and speaking as subjects, human rights subjects, who are making demands 
What would it mean to think of that as a moment of a disruption of the sensible? And in this I'm thinking of, there's a particular um, story that Monsieur uses in, in an article where he describes from a revolutionary workers newspaper um, a moment where a joiner, being an artisan, assumed to have no ability beyond the appreciation of the activity that he is compelled to do, stops to admire the beauty of the whole project. In that moment, it's not that he forgets the place that he has been put in, the power that operates over him, but rather he demands a moment where he still takes the space of admiring, of forming an aesthetic judgment. So Monsieur says, this ignorance is by no means the illusion that conceals the reality of possession. Instead, it is the means for building a new sensible world, which is a world of equality within the world of possession and inequality. So just as the joiner doesn't, in the process of admiring the beauty of the whole house, suddenly forget that he is the artisan and he doesn't own this house, so too I think that the person claiming their human rights in a particular moment doesn't suddenly forget that this whole system works to exclude them, but rather makes a demand of what the system says it is supposed to offer. So simultaneously demanding their equality, demonstrating their equality by being a speaking actor, and at the same time, as the system refuses to grant it, demonstrating all of the inequalities, all of the kind of limits of the promise of that system. So I'm quoting um, Andrew Sharp here, who's also used Monsieur to also think about human, human rights as a kind of, a, a, the potential of, a, of another form of human rights that might be kind of more um, politically engaged. So Sharp says, the subject of human rights emerges through political action and speech that seeks to verify the existence of those rights that are inscribed within the self-understanding of the political community. In doing so, the political subject demonstrates the reality of their equality as speaking animals and of their inequality within the social order. <coughs> so if so much of the human rights world has been constructed in ways that Spivak, who I'm very excited is going to be here in a couple of days' time, has described the difference between those who save and those who are always saved. If that's the dominant order of human rights, then what does it mean to think about the person who is usually saved and spoken for, speaking for themselves? And I will go back to, I wanted to, to use her particular words, but a, a colleague of Amelie, the woman I spoke of before, um, Jaya Deepa, who is another woman whose husband disappeared, um, who was again a, a village woman, um, who is now doing a degree, uh, has learnt English on her own, um, and has now become a prominent leader in the families of the disappeared movement, and is in fact now working with the Office for Missing Persons in, in Sri Lanka. So when I asked her about human rights and whether she thinks of herself as a human rights activist, she said, you take someone, say for example, my human rights are violated, and I'm fighting for it as it's a violation of my human rights. Say the fight is a hundred meter journey. I'm on my own, I'm on my own for 50 meters. Not even 50, say 75 meters. This is, these are her words, I like the, I've used this so many times now in my teaching, but the, the description of the distance. Traveling through all these 75 meters on my own, struggling, I identify my rights, I identify these are rights, these are rights that have been violated, and this is what should be done. Everything I learn, know, and I pass everything, and when I come to this juncture, it's 75 meters. I've come to 75 meters now. At that point, I get blocked. For example, say it could be an economic reason, it could be lack of awareness, lack of knowledge, what I should do beyond this, or it could be anything. So at that point, I need some support. So what happens? The people who come to support, they tell that they are people working on human rights. And then those people enter into this. And from 75 meters to 100 meters, they join or they take over my journey. And all what I've come through or my experience from 1 to 75 meters is completely ignored or forgotten. 
and from 75 to 100 meters is considered the best part of the work. Because of that, the impression is like they are doing the, human, the work and the best part on human rights. So my question is, how can we transfer our interest to think of that 1 to 75 meters? And what are the implications, not only ethically, but also politically and theoretically, of concentrating on the 1 to 75, rather than the 75 to 100? In some ways, I'm thinking about this as a kind of... A, so in some ways, as I said, I think it's about a, a deinstitutionalizing of human rights politics, of saying that human rights exists beyond the institutions of human rights. In some ways, I think, using Poncierre, it's a way of maybe repoliticizing the human rights project. In some ways, it's also, to quote another important person whose uh, shadow falls over here, it's a form of recognizing the subaltern legality, as Boaventura de Susan Santos has written about, to actually pay attention to the forms of legality that are operating beyond this kind of top-down transmission of legal norms down, but to actually try and pay attention to what is happening at some other level. It's also going beyond the project of vernacularizing human rights. So this has become quite trendy in human rights to say, okay, so there are these international norms and then there is a vernacularization process. Because that still assumes <coughs> that there is this kind of norm <coughs> created and then there is a process of kind of translating it into a local space <coughs> with, a, with a carrot or a stick. You, Put it in. What I'm trying to say is something different, I think. It's actually challenging where the norm is created and whose norm it, this is. So there are a number of ways in which I've been thinking about how this can be done. So one, I've been very interested in the work of a legal anthropologist um, called Julia Eckert, who works has worked a lot with slum communities in Bombay, Mumbai, in India. Um, and she has written about this idea of rumours of rights. So she has a beautiful story of um, an example of a woman who had married her daughter off, uh, got with dowry and everything. Um, the daughter um, had some, I think, psychological illness. Uh, the husband rejected her and refused to pay back the dowry. This woman had heard somewhere that there was this right to maintenance, which actually wasn't really a right, but she'd heard about a famous case that had happened in India, which actually involved a Muslim woman, so it was actually under a completely different law. But she'd heard a rumor that, yes, there was this thing, a right to maintenance. So she made the demand on the husband, well, if you don't pay the dowry back, we have a right to maintenance. And she threatened to go to the police. The husband didn't know any better, that there was this right to maintenance or not, but he certainly didn't want the police interfering in his business. And so he paid the dowry back, and the story was settled. So Julia Eckert picks up on that story and says, well, what does that say about law and legality, that even the rumor of a law can actually produce something in a particular space and can be used as a tool? So she describes how the rumour of a law of a right can provide the frame in which certain interpretations of a situation could be named. People act on rumours of possibilities, of opportunities. Many a strategy, many a plan or endeavour is motivated by rumours of possibilities. So is this one way in which we might disrupt the violent imposition of a particular idea of legality to say, actually, maybe this kind of rumour of law and what people interpret it to mean has a power as well that is going alongside the more formal interpretations. <coughs> so she also describes how this is not just about whether or not a person wins in a particular situation, but is actually also an expression of values and a reshaping of the legal norm of what the normal should be, of what the common sense of law actually is. So again, we have a kind of a law <coughs> operating at multiple levels. We have the whatever the formal law says, we have whatever people say law is in a particular setting and how they interpret it. And what is the relationship between those two things? Uh, is there a relationship between those two things? And what is 
the project of those of us who are interested in kind of challenging that violent imposition of law. What is what is our investment, and how might we support those projects of reinterpreting the law from a different position? <laughs> I want to also draw on another um, interesting example of a, um, a researcher who did some work on the use of human rights language in Togo. Um, the article is called The Right to be Trafficked, um, and Charles Pio, who wrote the article, describes how the language of human rights was being used in Togo not only by NGOs and government officials, but all, and by women's groups, but also by village children who were resisting parental authority and who actually were fighting for the right to go and be migrant laborers in Nigeria because they wanted to make money to buy consumer goods. So Pio concludes, the children who demand pay for field labor, those who leave for Nigeria, women who invoke human rights in seeking gender parity, apolitical opposition that invokes the term, all do so performatively without depending on state or institutional support, but also without fear of retaliation. In so doing, by invoking the term droit de l'homme, they are engaging in acts of cultural creation and laying claim to their own sovereignty. So if Pio is correct in his claim that the language of human rights is animating local cultural worlds in new and unforeseen ways, then what might our tracing of these alternative forms tell us? So I think that this is, as I said, not just an ethical project. I think it's not just about a political project. I also think that there is an epistemological project in this, that there is a possibility of, of alternate epistemologies emerging if we start from a point of other invocations of human rights and other interpretations of human rights. And we don't adopt this position which both advocates of human rights and critics of human rights tend to do, which is to say human rights is kind of unchallenged, it, is, it, it exists as it is, and that is this dominant articulation of human rights, which is UN, uh, international conventions, NGOs, politics, uh, this kind of technocratic governance structure. So this is just accepted. And then the project is about whether we <coughs> buy into this and say, yes, this is a good thing and it's better than, than nothing, or whether we reject it completely and wait for some other alternative project, political project, to emerge. So the other thing that I want to say about that, apart from trying to shift, I, no, so sorry, no, right, to finish that point, so one of the things that I'm thinking about here is that maybe the, the point isn't so much to be questioning whether human rights are this or that, but actually to think about who, the, the bigger challenge is to rethink who we are assuming is the subject of human rights. So if David Kennedy talks about, you know, we are the problem, we the human rights movement are the problem, maybe the issue is not so much looking at the human rights movement, but the we that is assumed by both the advocates and the critics. Because Kennedy himself is assuming a we that I'm assuming is not taking in the Amelies or the Ratnapurabatis. He is speaking of this we, the elite human rights movement, as if we are the only ones who are actually engaged in this game. So whether, as I said, we are promoting it in the name of saving other people, or we are critiquing it because these poor people are oppressed and then we are oppressing them further. In any sense, they are always the passive objects and we are the ones who are doing the critical thinking. Apart from the fact that I think this is inaccurate and I think there are other subjects of human rights who should be taken into account, I also think this helps answer the other major question that critics of human rights raise about whether or not human rights has kind of closed down the possibility of some other more radical political project. Because actually when I think about all of the people that I'm speaking to, the, the examples of the Betricelvis that I spoke of, Betricelvi is not committed to this liberal version of human rights. She hasn't given up on her Tamil nationalist politics, her socialist politics, 
Uh, she is seeing, she's not seeing these as like, okay, the, the, the socialist revolution is dead, the nationalist project is dead, and now I'm going for this liberal human rights project. Actually, she's weaving many different projects together in the way in which she's articulating human rights. So, the critics who say human rights, uh, you know, so the Samuel Moyne argument of, you know, <coughs> this is the kind of the death of all of the kind of uh, Marxist utopias, uh, you know, all of the other projects, the sort of third world nationalist projects are dead, and so therefore we now just adopt this liberal human rights model and maybe the neoliberal politics that go with it. Actually, the people who are invoking this in particular places are not seeing that. They're not rejecting it. And in Sri Lanka, many, many of the, the old leftists who were involved in the Marxist struggles, um, who became disillusioned with um, the violence associated with those Marxist struggles, have moved into using the language of human rights. But it doesn't mean that their Marxist politics have gone. That, but they don't see these as kind of mutually exclusive. They see them as mixed together. And so that made me, I was reading a book recently um, by Naja El Ali, who's um, writing about women's rights groups in Egypt. And she has a beautiful quote um, from some of the activists that she spoke to, which I think captures some of the, the uh, frustration that I also hear uh, from people I'm speaking to. So um, Al Ali writes, uh, Hania Kay and some other activists complained about the tendency among Western scholars who are doing research in Egypt to dismiss individual everyday experiences and the capacity to synthesize creatively from various value systems. So human agency is mainly framed in terms of collective ideologies. You are secular, you are religious, and very little space is given to individual improvisation and resistance. So I think, again, to, to pick up on the point of the person like Avet Ritelvi, who is articulating human rights through this practice uh, at the level of someone, I mean, to be a, an ex-LTTE cadre in contemporary Sri Lanka is not an easy political position, I mean, you know, subject to intense surveillance um, <coughs> and constant threat. But the fact that she is kind of so active, she is making use of the language of human rights to kind of claim a political space that otherwise is not available to her, so as a, a Tamil fighter in a now very consolidated Sinhalese Buddhist nation, she's not able to claim this kind of citizenship right so easily, so she's using the, the, the language of human rights as a form of political agency but doing so in a way that is mixing up many different value systems together and is actually much more creative and interesting than I think many of the kind of critics of human rights um, are giving credit to. Partly because I think that maybe those critics are looking in the wrong spaces when they are actually trying to work out what human rights actually does or doesn't produce in particular places. How long have I spoken for? Is that enough? You have time. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, I think actually that's that's kind of what I want to say. I would rather have like conversation and questions now. Um, I, I ended up, as you could probably tell because I was shuffling papers, uh, changing completely the structure of what I had written <laughs> to what I actually ended up saying. So now I'm like weaving together many different stories. So it might be better for me to actually ask what people want to know rather than try and take you off on another tangent. Yeah, thank you.